like there's no tomorrow. Hey! Hey! Hello, welcome everyone to the financial engineering course to lecture number nine. Today we will discuss hybrid models. Our ultimate goal from this course is to learn how to perform simulation and evaluation of a historical VAR and also XVA. Those two models, so XVA and HVAR, they depend heavily on hybrid models. Uh, why is that? It's typically because in a portfolio, so financial institutions like banks and pension funds, typically they have a, uh, in each portfolio, they have uh, products from different asset classes. For example, they may have interest rate swaps, also they may have some foreign exchange contracts, stocks, and so on. In order to have realistic scenarios for the future realizations, we need to have hybrid models. Those hybrid models are the processes, those models to, uh, that are used to simulate possible future scenarios that are later used in evaluation of X, VA, and also of, of uh, uh, VAR calculations. Uh, of course, ultimately, we also need to learn how to build up a portfolio of all those assets, but this will be also covered later in this course. Let's take a look at the content of today's lecture. Today, we have two blocks. Uh, in the first block, we will discuss more the motivation side on the necessity of using hybrid models for XVA and VAR. Uh, we also have a, a discussion on a, a very commonly used hybrid model, a black scholes hood white model. So this is a hybrid that is used for uh, connecting two asset classes, stocks and interest rates. However, this hybrid can be also easily extended to pricing of a foreign exchange, those FX, and interest rates. So this will be also later, we will use it heavily in the course when we'll be simulating uh, exposures for XV. And then we will finish this block with a, a concept of implied volatilities for models with stochastic interest rate. So this is, uh, if we have a stochastic interest rate, what is the meaning of uh, implied uh, volatilities? As you remember, in the Black-Scholes case, we have interest rate, which is constant. So how connect interest rate, which is constant, with stochastic interest rates that are used in the simulation. So we have to uh, make some uh, decisions. What is exactly the approach to hand to to address this uh, this problem? Um, second block will be about the stochastic volatility models. Here we'll be discussing um, schobel zuhl white model, hestel hull white so much more advanced hybrid models that they can also be used for XVA for generating realistic scenarios where. Uh, where the skew and smile are present. So um, we start here with the stochastic vol models for interest rates, so the generic framework for the inclusion of interest rates and stochastic volatility. I will show you also the motivation for using of the hybrid models, but not in the context of XVA, but in the context of uh, hybrid payoff. So here we'll be looking at diversification product and we'll be looking uh, investigating impact of correlations on pricing of such, a, of such a product. Then we move to Heston Hull White hybrid model. I will show you also the, uh, the, the difficulties with, uh, associated with this model, uh, especially in the context of fast evaluation of the model and fast calibration. So um, the bottom line here in this, um, those, let's say, stochastic volatility hybrid models is that it is easy to define a, a hybrid model which has stochastic volatility and all stochastic parameters, but at the end, uh, the ultimate goal is that we need to be able to calibrate the model to, uh, to, in, to a European type of options. So always these fast evaluations of Europeans is necessary. So I will show you how to use the heston white model, what type of, type of approximations we can perform in order to uh, be able to calibrate the model efficiently to European type of options. And then the last part is about the Monte Carlo simulation of hybrid models. And in particular, I will show you how to do almost exact simulation of the Heston Hull White hybrid. And I will finish this lecture with a, a summary and number of uh, uh, homework assignments. The main objective of this course is to be able to simulate XVA and HVA. By XVA, I mean here CVA, BCV, FVA, and many others. The details about the particular XVA aspects we will discuss in a 
comic lectures. And also the another one, another objective is to be able to simulate VAR, value of risk. So both to these two approaches, both to these two models, they rely on simulation of a portfolio at the future possible hypothetical realizations. So let us imagine that we have an asset, for example, a stock. So this would be time here with time axis here. We are observing stock value ST. The stock behaves in could behave of course like this, can grow, can go up and so on. So there are many different possible outcomes of the future realization of a stock in the in a, in, a, in the future, right? So we we are here at this point. This point is certain because we can read, we can um, we know the stock value today. However, the future is unknown. If we have a portfolio which um, consists of many of those stocks or even other assets in a portfolio, we would like to know how the portfolio risks, uh, what is the value of portfolio on the future time period. So basically, for example, we like to the distribution of our portfolio at this point. And of course, we have here three paths. So our portfolio will have three values depending on the value of the stock. And of course, portfolios will not consist only of one stock. They can be many, many different assets, but also asset uh, processes or stocks or even different asset classes can be involved in portfolio, which is not uncommon. Um, typically, portfolios will consist of uh, FX effect, um, interest rate products, stock, and so on. So you can imagine that if we have multiple factors, uh, factors that affect the value of portfolio, the, it's a very important to be able to simulate those factors in the future, such that we can use those future potential, future realizations to value our portfolio. And then based on evaluation of the portfolio of all those paths, for example, here we had three evaluations of the portfolio, we will apply some measures, like for example, then those measures or exposures, will be used to evaluate XVA and HVA. So when we think of exposure, exposure would be a value of our portfolio at future periods of time. And then of course, uh, in, in this case, we have only three realizations in reality, in a real um, applied uh, real scenario, we have multiple thousands of pos potential uh, simulations, paths that we will need to uh, use to value this portfolio. So exposures, it's a, it's a future value of our portfolio that we have some assets and we just want to see the distribution, evaluation, evolution of our portfolio in time. So exposures represent a potential future value of a portfolio or a derivative. We will concentrate, of course, on a portfolio because this is typical, this is practical. If we have only single stock, uh, I will show you in, a, in the next lecture that uh, if we have single asset, typically we can easily calculate those exposures and also HVAR almost analytically. But of course, the, the practicality is about evaluating of uh, those measures, those exposures and also those uh, XVAs and HVAR. Uh, if we deal with a portfolio that consists of assets or multiple assets, eh? so for example, um, it consists of contracts from different asset classes, for example, interest rate stocks, foreign exchange, commodities, credit, inflation, etc. So you see that if a portfolio of different asset classes, of products depending on belonging to different asset classes, all those asset classes, for example, interest rate, stocks, foreign exchange, commodities, everything is related. It's not that, for example, that stocks will be unaffected by interest rates. If interest rates move up or down, that will have significant impact on the stock realizations. Because, for example, stocks, uh, when we calculate current value of a stock, we look at the future cash flows of a company, and then we discount with interest rates that is present in the market. So if interest rates move, then also stock market uh, or stock uh, stocks will also move. Actually, in this particular case, it's very interesting explanation because if stocks would move, then interest rate would not necessarily move. So there is a one-way, let's say, correlation between these two, two assets. But the same is about the foreign exchange. Foreign exchange would be affected by FX and also interest rates. Right? So the interest rate would also impact the, um, because interest rates would impact how much the currency, whether strengthened or weakened, and that will have impact, of course, on FX, because FX shows you which currency is relatively cheaper or more expensive than other. And of course, the inflation is the same. Inflation is affected by interest rates. Then commodities is affected by inflation, interest rates, and so on. So you see, we have a multiple asset classes 
that they are correlated. And if we have a portfolio with multiple uh, instruments belonging to these different asset classes, we have to be able to simulate those processes in those classes. But of course, if we have multiple processes, stochastic definition equations, then we have to be also able to calibrate those multi-dimensional SDEs to market quotes. And this is something that we are going to discuss in this lecture. So today we concentrate on simulating of processes, uh, correlated processes from different asset classes, but also we're looking at the aspect of calibration, how to perform fast evaluation of those type of hybrid models. So whenever we deal with uh, uh, processes that um, uh, belong not to single asset classes, but for example, belong to, for example, stocks and interest rates, then you talk about hybrid models because then we have a mixture of two different um, two different things. Um, from the um, portfolio evaluation or exposure calculations, X var, etc., it is important that the netting effect is uh, preserved. A netting effect means that if we have multiple assets, then if we add them together, uh, then that could have impact on the portfolio. So because this correlation between um, uh, assets in our portfolio, then the values of those assets can offset each other. So if, for example, you are long stock and also you are short stock with other counterparty, your net position essentially is zero. So this is something to, uh, to be considered. So then your net position is zero. However, you still have two contracts with two different counterparties. So netting effect is also important and relations between the, uh, and different asset classes then also contributes to this netting effect uh, too especially if you talk about the future realizations um, of uh, a portfolio on a, in a different in a time horizon that we are interested in um, hybrid models so the hybrid models are the ones that involve multiple asset classes can be used for hybrid payoffs so uh, in the past the the, the research on uh, hybrid stochastic differential equations or hybrid models was not driven by XVA or HVAR or VAR calculations, was based uh, on exotic derivatives. So many years ago, it was in 2000s, it was popular that uh, or exotic derivatives available in the market could involve multiple asset classes. And those derivatives uh, needed to be priced with uh, models that involve multiple asset classes. Yeah, so if you have a payoff, it depends on uh, uh, stocks. It's a stock payoff, but also there is some kind of dependence on uh, interest rate performance. Then, in order to price such exotic payoff, you need to have a hybrid that would also um, um, mimic the relation, the, the relation between these two asset classes. And, however, um, because of the regulatory reasons, uh, these days pricing of exotics or selling exotic derivatives or buying them, uh, it is rather expensive because of the regulations, then uh, a lot of reserves need to be taken into account uh, or need to be uh, preserved because there is a model risk. Those models that involve multiple asset classes, those are not simple, uh, typically very simple models to handle. And also the liquidity of those exotics uh, may depend on the market circumstances. So if you have a very liquid uh, asset, like a stock, then you can always be able to sell or buy, very likely. Of course, the price will be not uh, good for you, but you can always uh, buy or sell. However, if you have exotic derivative, then the demand and supply is driven. You cannot see this price in the market directly on, uh, on the exchange. You have to call your clients, and then you have to get a quote for that price. So that will take you uh, much more time. So this liquidity risk premium, this risk has to be also offset by some kind of reserves. Because what if the market goes against you and then you would like to sell it, but there is no buyers. So of course that means risk. You have to make extra reserves for this type of risks. So in the past, the hybrid payoffs were popular. Uh, then because of the prices, the recession in 2009, 2008, uh, um, this um, interest in hybrid payoffs has decreased. However, hybrids are still back in life because um, they are used for those kind of XVA and HVAR frameworks. So this is actually they are the most important. Um, they are the most um, applicable applicability of those models is actually in those two um, models. So XVA and HVAR. Um, you can also think that um, there is another aspect, maybe uh, a little bit less important, that sometimes we deal with payoffs that they are not really um, sensitive to smiles. 
Um, for example, if you would have a, a call option, that would not necessarily mean that your call option would be dependent on a smile, if you have a very simple European type of payoff. However, if you think of uh, uh, evaluation of your call option and looking at some additional measures like potential future exposures, then it may be also in, good to have a model that also would generate smile in your realizations. However, uh, from practicality and also complexity of XVA uh, simulations, typically the market practice is to uh, keep the hybrid models as simple as possible in order to facilitate fast evaluations. As you can imagine, if we have a portfolio of uh, thousands of different trades and you like to evaluate at every time step, evaluate at all the uh, possible scenarios, or not all, but let's say thousands of different scenarios, that will be extremely expensive. So the objective also in the XVA and HVAR is to perform as few evaluations on all these future realizations as possible and such that the quality of the results will be preserved. Okay, so um, movements in an interest rate market may be influenced by the behavior of stock market. So this is this relation between different asset classes and then those kind of uh, processes, those kind of models we call hybrid models. Of course, in finance, we describe the behavior of different asset classes, different assets, but stochastic differential equations. So this is the kind of generic uh, model. So here, this bold X is a vector of different stochastic differential equations. We have different means, signals, and discussions on those processes. It was nicely covered in a course of computational finance that you can find also on this channel. So I'm not going to discuss possible what are the different processes for different asset classes. I would like to just, uh, we will go through some of those hybrids today, but this is kind of, you can think of, you have a vector of X, which X represents different assets, different, let's say, processes for different from different asset classes. And we, of course, we have correlation. So correlation between uh, those processes will take place via a correlating Brownian motion. Uh, here, actually, we have, you see, tilde, and this is not tilde here. Uh, in this course, if we have tilde, we mean uncorrelated Brownian motions. If we have tilde, this mean, uh, non if we don't have tilde, then we have uh, correlated. So in this case, actually, the correlation uh, effect, so it's, this is correlated. If we would have here tilde, this correlation will be somehow included in this uh, matrix signal bar. Um, so what is also important is that um, the hybrid models are not easy models to deal with in the first place. So if we have a, a model like Heston model or Black Scholes model, if you start including extra stochastic differential equations to allow some parameters to be stochastic, for example, interest rates or volatilities, then you will very soon realize that um, there is not so much room for you um, for um, evaluating on this model. So the biggest issue is that uh, at the end, if you like to simulate your scenarios, for example, here, uh, from a hybrid model, you first have to calibrate your model to the market data. And of course, even if you, for example, say this is this model that you have chosen, it's very realistic because those paths are really having I mean, skew, smile, and everything is nicely correlated, you still have to calibrate your model to uh, option prices. And for that reason, you really uh, strongly depend on the availability of a fast pricing for European type of options. And of course, European type of options, why we always talk about European type options is because we need volatility to be calibrated. So drifts, and especially if the stocks, those are don't need to be calibrated because those are implied from the market, but volatility is implied, is calculated from option market because this is the uncertainty we have to uh, extract, except for the volatility, uh, stock market, discounted stocks are always martingales. So then we, the drift part is nicely handled. The volatility is always calibrated from the uh, from option market. Um, so then, of course, another part is that if you have a stochastic differential equation and you add extra stochastic differential equation, you have to make sure that there's a correlation between those two. And many um, hybrids, uh, if we assume zero correlation, then we have really nice analytical solution for the model. However, if the correlation is non-zero, then some approximations need to take place. And today also we will discuss some of classical approximations that you can apply in order to evaluate your hybrid model. Um, the final step here, we have a, um, 
we can evaluate, of course, those hybrid models with uh, Monte Carlo simulations or PDEs. And then if we talk about um, evaluations of portfolio, it is much handier to deal with Monte Carlo. The biggest problem with PDEs is that uh, although this is very beautiful and very efficient framework, it has quite some limitations if we would like to apply it for evaluation of portfolio consisting of assets uh, from different asset classes. So we have stocks or different instruments from different asset classes, and this high dimensionality for PDEs is still um, an issue. Monte Carlo, it is just growing linearly in, in dimensions. PD is, PD is, this is not really the case. So uh, we stick to Monte Carlo, and that's also market practice for uh, simulating exposures and evaluating portfolio and the future realizations of those uh, uh, um, um, stock realizations or asset realizations. Uh, the speed of pricing derivative price, uh, so the speed of pricing European derivative products is crucial. So we typically calibrate the Europeans because those are the most liquid instruments in the market. Um, exotics typically less liquid, so as such they are, should not be used for calibration. On the other hand, uh, typically you would price exotics and you would hedge it with Europeans, not otherwise. So you would not hedge your risk from European option with by selling or buying some really complicated derivatives. So we always try to collapse, decompose exotics into simple products that are liquid and available in the market. Liquidity also means that BDASK spread is narrower, so that could reduce our costs of hedging. Um, so several theoretically attractive SDE models that cannot fulfill the speed requirements are not used in practice. So you can you may have a model which is beautiful, which has all sorts of uh, uh, nice parameters. However, because you are missing a close form equation for um, or approximation for pricing of European type of options, you cannot really use it. So this would be um, uh, not applied in, in practice. So the speed, although when you think about simulating of exposure, you may not really see directly the necessary for speed, but there are two necessary points, two important points where the speed is crucial. First one is the portfolio evaluation as few possible times on uh, on your realizations. So this is this is significantly uh, slow uh, part because portfolio can consist of thousands of different trades. And the second part is that you have to calibrate your model, and for that you need to evaluate your model often thousands of times in order to find local or global optimal uh, optimum minimum that will minimize the difference between the uh, market implied volatilities and model implied volatilities. Uh, so this is actually here, so we can define models which are um, typically um, easily definable, but if you would like to evaluate them, you really need to make sure that you can uh, calibrate the models. Um, so highly efficient evaluation, so this is an exclamation mark here, um, and calibrations are mandatory. For this reason, we focus to drive the characteristic function. And this is also related to what I have covered already in a computational finance course, uh, where uh, when we calculate, we derive characteristic function, and that characteristic function is used for pricing of European type of options, and this is our bridge to calibrate the model to European type of uh, uh, products. And this is some kind of um, let's say step that we you have to and um, you have to take. So in this course, I'm not going to focus so much on the cost method and all these Fourier transforms that you can use to price efficiently European type of options. However, I will uh, discuss cost method in particular in the context of stochastic interest rates that we haven't discussed in previous course. The discussion about the hybrid models, we start with extension of the Black-Scholes model with a uh, whole white for interest rates. So this is the dynamics of the uh, framework we have. So before, when we talk about the standard Black-Scholes model, we have uh, this stochastic differential equation, except for the interest rate, it is considered to be uh, constant. Uh, one can, of course, um, extend the Black-Scholes model interest rates to be time dependent. However, that's not going to make a hybrid model. It is just going to make a, one of the parameters to be time dependent. And that's a huge difference once we talk about uh, uh, stochasticity and time dependence. So um, here we have this RT. So the, um, in the Black-Scholes model, we have interest rate to be driven by the full white 
model. Full light model we have already well covered in the previous lectures. And here we have, so this is exact, the rest stays exactly the same as we had for the Black Scholes case. So we have a, uh, this is exponential, so it will be a log normal process. However, um, actually in this case, it will be also log normal because we have an interest rate, uh, which is normally distributed. We also have an integral of that interest rate as a solution and also this Brownian motion, which is also normally distributed. Uh, and for the interest rate part is, uh, um, is something that we have seen before. Of course, important part is that we have correlation between Brownian motions. Sorry for this. So we have this bra correlation between Brownian motions. And so these two are correlated. In practice, if we talk about uh, exposures for XVA or VAR calculations, then uh, volatility sigma and eta would typically be considered to be time dependent. Actually, once you talk about uh, uh, evaluation of your portfolio and the future realizations, it is kind of important that your sigma, uh, the volatilities from both processes, will be time dependent. And of course, the reason is that um, which sigma would you choose uh, to simulate uh, exposures from today up to 30 years? Would it be sigma for corresponding to maturity of one year, two years, five years? Uh, so that's not very clear which one to define. You could say, let's take the last one, so the 30 years. However, then your uh, pricing of the everything which is before 30 years, it will be mispriced. So if you have a Black Scholes model, then you have to make sure that you have pri your pricing options and the money accurately. And that could be achieved by having a sigma to be time dependent. If you don't have sigma time dependent, then you can only price one option uh, at the money accurately. And the same for volatilities, it's slightly different because we don't have, a, we don't trade RT. It's not a tradable um, uh, asset. It is non-observable even. However, we observe other quantities that depend on interest rates. So typically, interest rate part will be calibrated to uh, volatil interest rate volatility products, like for example, swap options or caplet floors, caps floors, etc. So this is uh, um, this is actually uh, the the idea of a problem calibrating interest rates. It is uh, uh, deserves a lecture on its own, and this will be discussed in the follow up course. Um, so this will be about the parameters. So our dynamics of this model is as follows. So it's just a two stochastic differential equations. As you can see now, you have this x t, which is bold, and then we have a, here it's a vector of two processes. So it's a, this is a vector is called state variable vector, vector of state variables x t. Um, first step, if we are thinking of a characteristic function, uh, or we would like to here the objective, of course, is to price our European options efficiently. We always perform in terms of if we talk about stocks, we always perform log transformation uh, because then we don't have a problem with affinity, at least for the log normal process. But typically, if we have a stocks, that's the first step to do. You take perform the log transformation. Uh, typically, the stock is not assumed, not allowed to be negative, then this log transformation is rather safe. And what we see here is that after log transformation, uh, x, t, it does not have any more any x dependence on the right hand side. We didn't do anything for the interest rates. Correlation is still preserved, so this doesn't affect the correlation between the Brownian motions. We can actually see from here that this model is affine. Uh, how I conclude that is that if I look at the drift in both cases, uh, okay, maybe there is a time dependent function, but time dependent function does not affect the affinity. We have uh, RT, so it's a minus lambda RT, so it is linear in state variables. And vector of state variables consists of xt and rt. So obviously it's linear in rt. And if I look here, we have some constant, and we also have rt, so it's still linear in, uh, in state variables. Okay, drift typically it is not a problem. The problem problematic part is always about uh, instantaneous covariance metrics. Uh, so if we look here, we have only constant coefficients in front of Brownian motions. So immediately we see that there is. Uh, no problem, even if there is a correlation between uh, these two Brownian motions, because then the covariance term will be sigma times eta times correlation. So you see, this is just a constant. It's not, uh, it's obviously, it's linear instead of variables. In a, it's a actually a trivial case. So if we have this uh, infinity, uh, then we can derive the characteristic function. Uh, I'm not going to go into details how this characteristic function is derived. This you can find in the course of computational finance in lecture six. It's a whole lecture dedicated to uh, this type of uh, um, derivations. Um, but 
most important step here is that we, if we see this affinity, if for hybrid models, we are still able to use the same technology methodologies for getting characteristic functions. And those characteristic functions can be used to price of European options. And then if we use uh, fast Fourier transformation, we can do the pricing of Europe options, European options uh, very fast, even for multiple strikes. So that's actually not a big issue. Okay, so um, then the solution of this currency function is given of this form. So this is again from uh, lecture number six from the computational finance course. So if we have affinity, then the, the currency function for the state variable uh, x, so it's actually, in this case, it will be two-dimensional. Um, but of course, for pricing of Europeans, we don't need directly dependence on interest rates. We only need this discounting. So u typically will be chosen to be um, just u zero. So this will be first coordinate and for the interest rate uh, will be zero. Actually here, I mean this, the first coordinate will be xt and the second will be rt. So if we are interested in one dimensional currency function, then this u should be uh, set to this because we are we don't want to have a joint distribution of xt rt we are only looking for marginal distribution for xt at certain maturity maturity of capital time t uh, so those are actually we have some boundary conditions um, for this uh, b and a but the details i will um, i will leave it to uh, for you to look up uh, in the lecture number six and what is important here is maybe that if you have a model which is affine, it belongs to this class, then those functions A and B, so the functions that represent the currency function, it actually, they uh, they are no enclosed form. It's actually a Riccati type of equations with a special matrices uh, B. And actually this is, so we have two, we have a function A, and here will be a vector of B, so be B for R and also be B2, let's say B1 for R, and uh, B, no, sorry, should be B1 for X and B2 for R, and then those two can be solved with this equation. So it will be a number of equations will correspond to number of state variables that we have. And then if you solve it actually for the case for black scholes full white model, uh, this is the solution what we have. So we have two variables, so this is corresponds to this variable to xt, this corresponds to rt, and for a we have, this is constant, so it's a time dependent, it's always present in derivation of currency functions, so a is always only time dependent, there is nothing um, happening there. Here, important part is that we have this integral over the time dependent theta function, so this this uh, theta is also, you maybe you remember, we calculated this theta from yield curve, such that the short rate model generates the zero coupon bonds, which exactly correspond to the zero coupon bonds in market. And here, this is exactly how this theta is constructed and has to be integrated with C. Of course, you can even further simplify this uh, integral. However, this is, I just leave it like this for the uh, complexity reasons. But indeed, even from numerical perspective, this is only integration with respect to uh, this is Z. Uh, if you look carefully, this U part you can actually take it outside of the of the integral. So this integral um, would be only taking place once for every time. If this would be also dependent on U, so for example, if you need to solve this Riccati type of equations for every U, then it's a it's a kind of um, much more complicated issue. And I will show you also in this lecture that in types types of hybrid models like for example Schobel Zuckel White. Uh, those Riccati type of equations cannot be solved analytically. And then indeed, you will see dramatic increase of time necessary for the evaluation of the characteristic function. So even before you get to the density or before you get to European options, the characteristic function evaluation, although it is uh, known because model is affine, it is quite still expensive. Okay, so um, what we do, so this is the, how you can get the currency function and you can use the cost method. I will show you in a few slides how to do that. Uh, on the other hand, uh, we can find the price of the, uh, of the black scholes school white model uh, actually for European options analytically. So we don't need to uh, go through the Fourier. This is just for illustration reasons, how to handle stochastic discounting if we have uh, um, cost method and also if we have those kind of hybrid, two-dimensional hybrid models. So um, your appearance type option, um, of course, trick here in this um, um, in this approach because we have this stochastic discounting. Uh, 
uh, the trick here would be to use Radom Nicodem's derivative to switch from the risk neutral measure where we discount with a money savings account to discount to the move to the T forward measure because with a payment of European option at a given time and then move to that T forward measure and that will happen actually to be very beneficial for handling of uh, hybrid models once we deal with stochastic uh, discount. So this is definition um, expectation of a European type of payoff which pays at time T and then the underlying here is S. And so, of course, we can exchange this so we can write this down expectation in the integral form and the random Nicodem derivative. So once we switch from a, a risk neutral, actually here, this random Nicodem derivative, it is from a, a changing from a T forward measure to Q, but doesn't really matter because it's always exchanges. Uh, anyway, whatever you have in this uh, uh, fraction here, remember, uh, first you do uh, the value of this uh, number year and the maturity, the value of this number year in the beginning, then we go back, the value of this uh, number year at the end, and divided by the opposite. So it's always whatever fraction you will choose, you, you, the, whether you switch from risk neutral uh, to the T forward or T forward to risk neutral, it doesn't really matter as long as you're consistent because then you just can invert the fraction and then you get back exactly what you have, uh, what you want to have. So here, from here, we meet you know, the, the, the measure transformation from uh, dq to dqt. Of course, this part you can substitute into an integral. So we take this, we substitute here, and then we end up with uh, this expression here. Of course, this will cancel out with this. If m0 will cancel this, this m, uh, um, this is p t0 t can go outside of the integral because this is deterministic, and this quantity here is equal to 1 because it's a zero coupon bond, which was exactly, as you can see, it's a PTT. So this is a value exactly paying one because we are observing it in the payment date. So that simplifies, of course, because then we end up with uh, uh, the, the value of European type payoff under the stochastic discounting. After the measure transformation, we have a zero coupon bond corresponding to the pay date of this European type of payoff. And then we take expectation under the T forward measure of this payoff. Of course, here, as I already mentioned before, we have this S and this S has to be still the dynamics under the T forward measure. So this is important. We cannot just simulate under risk neutral measure. We have to change the dynamics of S to be under the uh, Q T forward measure. So this is the relation that we have. And so we still need to derive this dynamics of S under the T forward measure. When we look at the stock and the stock discounted stock, so ST over MT, so ST over MT, this quantity has to be marking. So if we look at the dynamics of it, we will see that it will be a zero times TT, so with no drift, and then we have a volatility DWT, and this will be Q, and Q corresponds naturally to the money savings account that is used for discounting. However, um, this quantity, so uh, ST over MT, it's not a martingale if we would have here the WTT. Right? So uh, it is a martingale under this measure. However, this quantity is not a martingale under T forward measure because this T here does not correspond to the uh, money savings account, but it would correspond to the zero coupon bond. However, uh, what we can also do, we know that if we change number year from a money savings account to the zero coupon bond, that would also need to be martingale. So let me write it down here. So if I go now to here, so this quantity, so D, S, T, then we have a P, T, T. We know that this also will need to be martingale, zero, B, T. And we have here some volatility, D, W, we have a T, T. But you see now this Brownian motion here, so this is Brownian motion, D, W, T. This Brownian motion, it corresponds to this number here. So then we know that this will be still martingale. So this is something that we already discussed in lecture number two about those uh, martingalities and measure changes. So this is also important that if we change number year, every asset in this economy will need to be a martingale or discounted with that number year needs to be martingale under that corresponding measure, corresponding measure to the number year. So now what we will call uh, what we will do, we define, so we know this has to hold. So we define the forward stock price. 
And this happens to be very handy because if we talk about a, a forward stop price, then you will see that this counting effect will be disappearing from the dynamics of the process. And then instead of having two dimensional stochastic differential equations for stock and for interest rates, actually we will, we will see then that the dimensionality will reduce and we only will deal with a one dimensional a process for the forward stock price. Let's go step by step. So first what we do, we define this forward stock price and this quantity here, it is equal to this quantity up here. So we know that this has to be driftless. On the other hand, we know that the stock value uh, under, so this SFTT, if we go at the maturity, so if you would like to evaluate European type option, then this T would become capital time T. And then we'll know that this will be equal because this zero coupon bond, which is here in the denominator, will be only the capital time T, and this will be equal to one. So then we only end up with a ST. So this also happens to be very handy once we talk about the payoffs. And I will show you this in a in few slides. So this quantity now, what we can do, we can derive ETO and we will find out what is the measure transformation, of course, for this process, how this process, forward process looks uh, under that T forward measure. So what we do, we apply Ito's lemma, and of course this is rather straightforward because we only have two assets, we have a stock and also zero coupon bond, so this is straightforward Ito's application, and then if you substitute here the dynamics, this is the dynamics of the uh, zero coupon bond under the whole white model, so this is something we already discussed also in the previous lectures, and here we substitute the dynamics for the stock under uh, the, the one that we have seen, so this is the stock process under the risk neutral measure, then we will end up uh, with the, um, the process for um, DSF as divided by SF, but this after the measure transformation, you will see that this will be equal to this um, stochastic differential equation. So here in the step, uh, we also had to perform the measure change because we have to enforce this martingality condition. So as we have seen here, and that would lead us to the uh, measure transformation. But for the, the details on those particular measure changes for the full white model to change from the uh, risk neutral to the T forward and also uh, the stock to move to the T forward, I recommend just to go back to the lecture where we talk about the measure changes for the full white model and also the measure changes from lecture number two, where I showed you how to uh, impose the martingality condition and how to find out the radom nikodim change, the Girizanov theorem, how to apply it in order to change the measure chain, to change the dynamics of the process. But what is important here is that if we do this measure transformation, so actually no measure transformation, but we define this ethos and we substitute all those processes. So here actually you can substitute already the process under the so this will, you will substitute first the process under the Q measure, and then you will change measure to T. This is what we end up with. It looks kind of like a black shoulders. However, there is only one thing that now we have uh, two Brownian motions, because one Brownian motion will correspond corresponds to the process for X. So actually, this is the process corresponding to this S stock. And then the second Brownian motion corresponds to interest rate R. So surprisingly, um, this is the cost. So we started with two stochastic differential equations. We changed uh, with a new variable as the forward stock. We found its dynamics. And, and now, once we change the measure to the T forward measure, we realize that actually, OK, this process now indeed is driftless. However, we end up with uh, two Brownian motions. So this is uh, uh, something we have to still to deal with. Uh, of, and also, those Brownian motions are correlated. So there is this correlation raw between those uh, uh, two brown emotions. Actually, maybe one more step. Uh, the steps uh, derivations here, I think I have uh, we have nicely covered in the book also. So please take a look if you like to have all the details on those steps in the book. OK, uh, so what we will do now, we will do some kind of factorization. Factorization means that um, we will um, put together those two Brownian motions. So these two Brownian motions we will put together in represent in this way. Um, important thing is that this factorization which I'm presenting here. So if we have two Brownian motions, W1 and W2, they're possibly correlated. So there's a correlation wrong. We have constant A and B. In distribution sense, this will be equal to this term. So if a one Brownian motion and then we have this correlation, you see will will be popping up here in the front of this Brownian motion. However, this is important that this will only hold 
in a distribution sense. So this means that you cannot really use this kind of transformation if you would like to price something which is path dependent because distribution sense equality means that it only matches at the, part, at the particular expiry. There is no path, uh, the, uh, path equality. So this is rather weak uh, convergence or weak equality. Uh, it is, however, sufficient for us because at this point we are interested in pricing of, uh, of European options. So this means that we are only interested in a marginal distribution. We don't look for any uh, transition des uh, densities. We only look at the marginals. So that this is uh, perfectly fine. But keep in mind that this kind of transformation would um, destroy the path dependence between those Brownian motions. So in the, if you have a path dependent payoff, you will see that you are uh, mispricing. Uh, and oft, okay, so then if we apply this in this uh, uh, finding to this uh, two Brownian motions, this is what we find. When we find that there will be a, the dynamics of SF, uh, it is equal to, it's okay, it's divided by SF, so it's kind of log normal because this F will be in, on the other side. And then we have this uh, sigma bar F, where this is, of course, this is the initial guess, initial, sorry, initial condition. And then we have this time dependent function sigma FT. You see, this is, and this path dependent, actually, sorry, the time dependent part comes from the uh, interest rate because this function BR, it is time dependent. So this is not stochastic, it's time dependent. So very interesting finding. So we started with a Black-Scholes model with a sigma parameter that was constant. We included also stochasticity of interest rates. So we had hybrid model with uh, two stochastic differential equations. Then we defined the forward stock. We found its dynamics on the t-forward measure. And actually we realized that actually, that actually that, that the volatility for this uh, forward stock it's not any more constant, but it's time dependent. And time dependence is impacted, influenced by the interest rate volatility. So this is this part here. If we those, for example, if the correlation here would be zero, you, you would still have a time dependence. However, you, you need to kill volatility of the interest rate only to go back to the initial uh, sigma squared, or so actually sigma as the volatility function. So this is a very interesting finding, and uh, uh, this, in essence, you can apply to all hybrid models which involve interest rates and, for example, stocks. Later, I will show you that this will be the same applicable if we talk about FX processes, uh, but this is typically the step. So you start with a hybrid with a two, uh, with stochastic discounting or stochastic process for interest rates, and then you just move to the forward measure, uh, and then you look for the dynamics, and then from there you will notice that uh, your problem simplifies. Uh, so the question maybe here, uh, we know where is the volatility. Volatility for interest rates, now it is in a volatility of a uh, forward stroke. And discounting part, so this PT0, is actually came to the initial. So we have uh, also this expectation. We know that if we change the process, then discounting comes outside the um, the expectation. So if we change measure from risk neutral to a T forward, the P zero T, so we have a P T zero T comes outside of the ex expectation T forward measure. So we have this discounting comes outside and then we have a process which is of simplified form. Another important question we have to answer is the question related to calculation of implied volatilities. What is the meaning of implied volatility if we deal with stochastic interest rates? Um, in Black Scholes model, we had interest rates that they were fixed and to be constant. Of course, in the Black Scholes world, we could also extend interest rates to be time dependent. However, there is a big step between uh, constant time dependent and stochastic. Stochasticity makes it much more difficult. So. Which interest rate shall we choose in the Praxels formula to calculate implied volatility? And this is the part that we are going to answer in this blog. Um, first of all, once we talk about implied volatilities, uh, remember that we always talk about the prices. So first, if we have whatever model we choose and we calculate prices, then we have to use those prices to find implied volatility for Black Scholes. Of course, it would be beneficial as we already presented in previous slides, that if we switch between measures from a, a risk neutral to a T forward measure, 
then the stochasticity of interest rates is not directly present in the dynamics of the forward stick. This means that we can actually neglect the, the stochastic discounting from payoffs. And this is also the route how we can link it to the Black Scholes type of pricing where interest rates are not really present because the discounting part takes it's taken outside of the expectation. Let's take a look again. So to summarize this process, um, I will show you some derivations, how the building blocks are uh, constructed. And also we will look into Python code. We will show you the equivalence between the two approaches. Okay, so um, here we have, um, again, uh, Black Scholes full wide. So this is stochastic uh, interest rate. We know that by changing uh, to, uh, by defining the forward stock and then looking at the forward measure, we have the following uh, stochastic differential equation. So our process, two-dimensional process, we have kind of squeezed into one-dimensional process such that uh, the marginal distributions of the two at any time and at the maturity time, capital time T, they'll be the same. So it's kind of trick we have formed. But on the other hand, because we have this time-dependent sigma, so the sigma f here, it is just time-dependent function. So actually what happens is that because um, this process doesn't have a drift, this process for SF, and only has a time-dependent volatility, we are able to find a Black Scholes type of equation. You can see this is the equation um, derived here. Uh, the details on those steps you can find in the book, but actually it resembles just the Black Scholes equation with no interest rates. So you see there is no R anywhere. We have a discounting, which is taken outside of the expectation. So this is the part which comes from the measure change. And here we have a, uh, we, we look at the uh, option value of S of TT, but we know that this is equal to S capital time T, because the zero coupon bond at the maturity is equal to one. And then because the, the dynamics of this process S of is so simple, because there's no drift, only time dependent volatility, we are able to find uh, the Black Scholes type of equation for pricing of this option. And you see here, we still have this uh, sigma c, and the sigma c is defined actually as the integral or sigma f uh, time dependent. Yeah? So this is the one, this sigma f is the one we have seen here in this equation. Uh, in order to get this pricing, we need to look at the integral of that function. And so this actually, you see that right now, everything collapsed to a single sigma. So in a, if we look at the pricing of European option, we actually look at the integral, we only look at the constant value. Of course, this has to do with the fact that still we are interested only in the marginal distribution and the maturity. So we are only pricing European type option. And then the function type, how it behaves, whether it's uh, this or it is like that, it doesn't really matter as long those integrals are equal over those functions. So this is the important element. Of course, if you would like to calibrate your, you would like to find sigma f uh, such that would calibrate, would, not, would be well calibrated to different maturities, of course, then you have to really take care of the shape of those functions. Uh, actually, this shape wasn't really good for implied volatility, by the way, because typically volatility should be like this or like that. Uh, so um, this sigma, it doesn't really play a role if we look at the European option pricing. Um, Often, if you hear, if you see in the literature, um, the time, de the mapping between time-dependent function and mapping to a constant, in terms of model parameters, this is typically called effective parameter. Effective means we are looking only, you are mapping the time-dependent parameter into constant, and to making sure that the marginal distributions, so the payments at given fixed time, are the, the option values are the same. That's the called effective parameters. Uh, when this actually would hold. Let's take a look at the, uh, the pricing part. So um, I prepared some codes. Uh, let me take a look. So here um, we have, uh, so let's start from the main function. Here we define some full white parameters. We have a maturity of five years, some zero coupon bond, which is also important in this case. Uh, and here we have a, a cost method. So the idea here is to look at the uh, cost method pricing using the affinity of the Black Scholes school line model. So we derive this characterization function and then we use the cost method to evaluate it. Later in this lecture, I'll go through exactly the details how this uh, uh, stochastic discounting is handled in the cost method. For now, it is just uh, uh, not so relevant. 
and then we do go for the option pricing uh, as derived in in the slide. So here you see that we have a, we look at the forward stock value, which is S over P zero T. So this is constant. Then we look at this volatility function. Volatility function involves this integration. So we have this. Uh, uh, integration of um, because we have this function br and we still have to integrate over this sigma f function so you see there is some kind of uh, there, there is involved integration inside uh, in order to get this uh, um, this expression for constant c so this part uh, uses this uh, uh, sigma f uh, uses the time dependent br and then we have uh, uh, from there we calculate the integral and then we take a square root of that and with also with scaling of time and then we have this constant parameter sigma c that we can also use in the uh, in the pricing so if this is actually what happens so this is the currency function then we have this uh, again the price and then here you see i'm just using uh, once i calculate the volatility i fix interest rate to zero and then we have a black scholes equation for interest rate zero forward stock and then we have volatility, which is integrated one. And then the output we multiply with P0T. So you see that once we have even this stochastic discounting, and actually this model in particular, Black Scholes Full White, then you represent it for European option prices as just a Black Scholes equation with a proper adjusted volatility. And then we have to make sure that we lose proper discounting. So if you run this code, you see nicely there is, uh, so I'm doing, um, we have two graphs here. The first, we look at the option prices. So exact, the one that we just uh, derive, so this effective product against cost method uh, based on the characteristic function. And then we have a second part where we look at implied volatility. So here important is to see that even if we have this two-dimensional stochastic differential equation, we have stochasticity also from interest rates, you see there is no impact on implied volatility smoothing. So very important takeaway, if you have a stochastic interest rate, you cannot include, it does not generate, your model will not generate smile or skew for options on the stock. You may have indeed a uh, skew or smile in the interest rate part, but your uh, uh, stock part will not be affected by the skew which comes from the interest rates. And this comes from the fact that we actually have uh, uh, the mapping from uh, vol by inclusion of interest rates, we have the volatility of a stock did not become stochastic it become only time dependent. So time dependence in volatility for stock means there will be no skew, no smile, only flat volatility for every strike. The stochasticity is just missing there. So this is very important uh, takeaway. Let's go back to the, uh, to the slides. So here, um, now, let me also click here. Okay, so now we have, did, we have done this experiment when we compare, uh, and now we go to the Black-Scholes full white implied volatilities. Of course, now we have this uh, extra process that is included in the Black-Scholes model. So there would be some impact on volatilities. The question is, which dimension? Is it in a strike? In strike basically would mean that we can have a interest, uh, uh, we could have implied volatility smaller skew, or is it time? Of course, it is only time because we have this uh, function here this function for sigma, sigma f, you see, it is only time dependent. We don't have any extra stochasticity. So in the Heston case, for example, there will be a stochastic process for the variance, be stochastic process for the volatility. Here we have only time dependence, and this time dependence comes only from the interest rate uh, effect. Um, so again, so clearly, time dependent volatility functions insufficient to generate implied volatility smiles but it is sufficient to describe implied volatility in term structure and this is because volatility become time dependent uh, here in this experiment now we will look into uh, have set up some uh, uh, fix some parameters so volatility for stock uh, mean reversion for the interest rates, volatility for interest rates correlation and then what we will do we will change different parameters and one by one, we will change and change back. And then we will observe impact on the implied volatility uh, on the term structure volatilities. So let's take a look. Let's go back here. And here. And here we will uh, look at this picture. So 
I'm just repeating experiment from uh, so this option price that we have uh, calculated using this analytical expression. So this is what we have seen before. And then I'm just using, I calculate implied volatility, Black's volatility that we have also already discussed in the previous lecture. So here you only need to make sure that you have uh, you properly scaled your uh, forward stock. And then uh, this is actually forward value. I mean, this is maybe not even in forward value. Yeah, this is this is fine. So this is initial stock, and then we have a forward value for the option price, and this forward value of the option price is used in the implied volatility calibration using the actual. So let me run it, this code, and this is what we see. So we have a. So this is the first part. So mean reverse. So this is speed of mean reversion. This is implied volatility. We see that lambda has impact indeed on a stock implied volatility term structure. And obviously, lambda was also a parameter which was included in sigma f for the stock. And actually, it, uh, it changes to some extent some level. It is not really, you cannot really control the level up and down, but to some extent, you can see the term structure of volatilities. Uh, in Once we talk about, because here you see, in the, an x-axis, we don't have strikes, we have maturities. So we are not allowed to talk about the smiles or skews. We can only talk about the term structures. So your volatilities can go up or down, and we see a little bit of a kind of a thump volatility, so it's increasing. A similar impact from, vol from the vol vol, so volatility of interest rates, is the same kind of pattern as, the, as lambda. Typically, uh, a lambda parameter would be fixed or uh, pre-calibrated, and then one would just uh, calibrate time-dependent eta or even constant eta but for fixed lambda. And the reason for fixing one of them and typically fixing a mean reversion is because of what we see here, that if we have a fixed one, we can essentially obtain similar shape of uh, implied, actually of the term structure of implied volatilities. Uh, so there is no necessity of uh, having two parameters that would complicate uh, the calibration. The volatility of uh, stock uh, here, for example, we see that indeed it is uh, like in Black Shoals, by changing volatility, we can change the level of implied volatilities. And there is a little bit of uptrend, and this is also maybe related to, the, yeah, it is related to those additional parameters and behavior here. And the correlation, the last one, uh, yes, it's maybe, it's interesting that it can actually the effect because of the positivity of negativity. Uh, so then overall variance of our sigma f is going up or down. And depending whether the variance goes up or down, this will have a positive or negative impact on our implied volatilities.